Dear friends, welcome again to Stalin, sorry, Music Under Stalin. Um, and today we're going to talk about Prokofiev. It's going to be a parallel story to the one we had last time, so covering roughly the same period, 1936 to 42. And uh, with hindsight, I should have put a question mark to my title, because this is the period when you don't yet say, uh, with an exclamation mark, Prokofiev, the Soviet artist, but you still have a question mark over that statement. Uh, so the big question that everyone keeps asking, as I've seen on Twitter and Facebook, uh, why did he return to the Soviet Union? Uh, because as you may know, he emigrated, or rather he left uh, Soviet Russia in 1918. Uh, he left it with permission, but he traveled east. Uh, he went uh, on the Trans-Siberian Railway and then uh, over Japan and the Philippines to uh, the U.S. Uh, ended up in New York and started, with the help of various Russian emigres, a career um, of a composer and a pianist who played mostly his own music, but not just his own music. Then, yeah, about 1921, he moved his base to Paris. He continued to travel, developed quite a, a lot of international connections, usually went on tour once a year to the U.S. because it was the most lucrative. Uh, and... Uh, so from our perspective, or maybe from the perspective that we've developed during the Cold War, it's a very strange decision to, in 1935-36 to return to Soviet Russia. And uh, so I've uh, amassed, uh, was been, been gradually accumulating uh, during my research various answers to this question. So we, are, we will just try to ponder in what way his decision is not completely ridiculous, it's not quite as naive as people say, and uh, it doesn't have a kind of evil streak to it, as, as some people have suggested. So, uh, as I said, he left Russia with permission from Lunacharsky, the culture minister, so uh, the return was always a possibility. He never quite settled abroad, never bought a house, uh, he never held any strong political views. Um, he had a very interesting brain, uh, a brain which, uh, which was different. If you read his diaries or if you read his letters or especially his, the short stories that he wrote, you realize that he saw world in, in a different way. Some people have suggested that he was on the autism spectrum, that he was neurodiverse. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a, a very difficult enterprise to kind of research the medical history of dead composers, so we're not going to do that. Uh, but there's definitely some way in, a, in which we have to understand how he thought. And he thought about world events as a kind of chess game. You know, he, he was interested in what was going on, but he didn't have deep emotional and moral involvement in those events. Uh, nevertheless, when he was abroad, he was trying to uh, not get too involved with the Russian emigre who were anti-Soviet. Yeah, it's as if sort of imagining that at some stage he might want to return. So his return was a protracted almost 10-year-old process. It was 1925 when Soviet authorities first started wooing him. And they did him, uh, that not just with him, but also with Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky, as you know, to no avail. Um, and uh, uh, Prokofiev uh, f went for the return trip back for the first time in 1927. Uh, he had complete adulation of his Russian public, uh, and he wanted to come back again and again. It's like he found or regained his audience again. Um, Another uh, good reason for him to return is that in the West, he needed to uh, rely on concertizing, uh, which, of course, was eating time uh, from his composition. Um, he had to practice the piano, and that took a long time, and he, he was always very aware that the, the more he practices, the more he tours, the more he manages his touring, because he was his own manager as well, um, he, that, that detracts uh, and distracts him from composition. And staying in Europe or even in America was not that great at that point, you know, when the 1930s began, because you had the Great, great Depression in America, you had the rise of fascism in Europe, which meant that various countries became closed for touring. All the touring routes had to be you know, rethought. 
And he wasn't alone uh, to want to come to Russia and uh, find a new career there. Quite a lot of his friends were actually asking him for pro uh, some kind of protection, yeah, for uh, connection, connections in the Soviet Union. Help me you know, to get a tour there, or maybe I could move. But it's just not everyone was as much wanted as he, uh, as he was in the Soviet Union. And uh, perhaps... Uh, most importantly, he really did believe in his ability to be the leader of Soviet music. He believed that his music um, was suitably tonal and melodic and accessible uh, to be just what they wanted. Yeah, he wanted to write his music for the people, and he imagined that he would be doing it in two streams. Yeah, so some works would be really complex and uh, um, appeal to the more sophisticated uh, people in his audience. And, and some more simple pieces, like pieces for children, for example, you might know, um, that he was really good at uh, composing. So all these reasons, um, and really very intense <laughs> wooing, yes, as, as I said, that he was promised uh, a lot of things. And the main thing that he was promised, that he could uh, just concentrate on composition, and that whatever he wanted to be performed, uh, would be immediately performed. Every Philharmonic society, he was told, would, would be loving just to put your concert on at, at no notice at all. So uh, we will see how that worked out. And of course, the, the final thing, yeah, he never imagined that he would not be able to travel. He just imagined that he would be con continuing his international career with the base in Moscow. Um, and that wasn't possible. There were other very important returnees. For example, Alexei Tolstoy, they're all writers, by the way. Of course, for writers, it was much more attractive to come back to the Soviet Union because they could write in Russian and have a larger audience. Uh, but Alexei Tolstoy, as you can see, he's done very well for himself. He's just, uh, his life was a complete banquet, a <laughs> continuous banquet when he was in the USSR. Uh, the return of Maxim Gorky, um, you know, huge crowds meeting him, Alexander Kuprin. Uh, so there were other people who wanted to uh, come back. So once he's coming back, this struggle starts, this battle you know, for, um, for the style, for the new style that his audience would require and the officials would put up with. So this is why I call this grappling with the Soviet style. By the way, pay attention to these lovely paintings that I put up. I, I think they are all not quite socialist realists. So in my view, most of them reflect uh, the similar position of, of the artist yeah, who is trying to depict various, very Soviet subjects, such as the opening of the Moscow Metro, but in a slightly strange way, you know, not maybe completely realist. So uh, he was optimistic uh, also because that he would be able to perform various large-scale works that he wrote in the West in Russia, and sometimes his optimism really was uh, uh, quite extraordinary. He thought that the Fiery Angel, for example, an opera about devilry, uh, would be a good thing to perform. Uh, that, of course, is unimaginable, but uh, he was an optimist by, by nature. He always thought that, that they would be performed. Uh, now, what is the, the, the problem, really? Why did he have such trouble fitting in? even though yeah, his music was melodic and tonal and maybe much more accessible in comparison to his other um, peers in the, uh, out there in the West. First of all, I think, while living abroad, he was always a, a few steps behind of how yeah, the, the trends, the mainstreams, the fashions uh, of Soviet music developed. Yeah, he, was, he was always trying to catch up because it's impossible not to be there yeah, and kind of follow it precisely. But also, he resisted, I think, just imitating these styles because originality was very important to him. He had this pride in his individual style. He knew what to be Prokofiev was. So he still wanted, if he wanted to write a melody, even accessible melody, he would do it in his own way. Uh, and another reason, yeah, he was, he was prone to recycling his music. Yeah, so he would take one, one theme that he might have used in one work and reuse it in another work. And that is something um, that didn't go so well with the Soviet authorities because I think deep down they believed that music had 
something inherent in it, some, the content was tied, tied to it, yeah? so that, that you couldn't just take one song and change the words and completely you know, uh, sing it. It was a, the white song, white guard song, and then it would be the red song. Uh, that was always problematic. Uh, and uh, Prokofiev, I think, was, was absolutely okay with it. It was, was roughly fitting. He, he would easily move it from one work to another. But that was kind of another reason why there was this problem. I will begin with a very interesting work which he wrote in 1933, and that's certainly probably the first one that he writes with the Soviet audience in mind. Although it's not made explicit, there is no text, it's a 20-minute uh, orchestral piece. To my mind, it's very beautiful, very rarely performed. Uh, I think what he's trying to do there is to uh, create the standard Soviet narrative, yeah, from darkness through struggle to victory. Yeah, victory of communism, I guess. He might be uh, inspired by something like Shostakovich's Symphony No. 2 to October, yeah, that I showed you in one of the lectures. So having a yeah, similar trajectory. So let's see how this sounds. Yeah, so this is a dark beginning. Point, yeah, I, I want to play to you. It can be associated with struggle, yeah, so something's happening. you will have a positive ending in the major. It's actually a beautiful lyrical theme. Yeah, the whole thing is a song. Yeah, so he wants it to be kind of vocal. He wants it to be very lyrical. Mm, and uh, there's a wonderful moment here yeah, when he reaches for the cadence. The cadence is very protracted. Yeah, so we expect this ending. Yeah, and at the very moment, last moment, he achieves this triumph. I think it's beautifully done. So this was the review that he got. The principal mood of the symphonic song is fatigue and sickly despair. The musical material is so abstract that in instead of concrete living images, we are faced with melancholy immaterial arabesques. The composer's orchestral palette produces various pictures that are striking mainly for the gloomy, elegiac background against which low melodies of solo instruments appear as if lost in sound space together with the dim sonorities of certain group of instruments. The symphonic song is an elegy to solitude. Its lyrical emotion is the emotion of social and cultural homelessness in a man who is disappointed by the present and is unable to believe in the future. It is on a par with the moods of the frustrated and weary urban lyricists of the West today. Yeah, so uh, that's a damning criticism. The critic obviously didn't listen properly. Yeah, the critic uh, is not very intelligent because I actually had to work quite hard to make it co coherent. You know, he can't even write sentences. But it didn't matter. 
Yeah, the, the, the work basically sort of stalled. Yeah, it, it wasn't uh, performed much again at all because it was taken as a, as a foreign work rather than a Soviet work. Yeah, so they didn't hear what he actually wanted to say with it. Now, the next story uh, is on a much larger scale. It's the cantata for the 20th anniversary of the October Revolution, which he started writing many years before that anniversary. Yeah, so that actually at the start of the 30s, and it comes from the idea of setting to music some words by Lenin. Uh, he, it, it's a modernist project. Yeah? Take some words which are completely uh, sort of ridiculously unfit for music and set them to music. This is what Prokofiev was known for. Yeah, so he was fascinated with this idea. And gradually, uh, the whole thing, as it became bigger and bigger, um, uh, start, uh, also involved uh, quotations from Marx and then girls, yeah, from the Communist Manifesto and um, also Stalin's speeches. Yeah, as, as you went in towards 1937, towards the anniversary, Stalin, of course, had to be there too. So uh, you can see it's, it's a fantastic work, which, which is uh, much more performed than, than the symphonic song. But you can see how, in a sense, uh, he treats these images in, in this very direct way. Yeah, he likes portraying things. So if it's a specter of communism, yeah, so you can literally hear or see with your inner eye the specter of communism sort of walking towards you. Prokofiev could have written this yeah, for some kind of, I don't know, demon character yeah, in a fantastical setting. So here, this is a specter of communism. Now, uh, the, uh, the words that are engraved on, <clears throat> on Marx's tomb uh, in Highgate, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Uh, these words here are, are set in part two um, of this cantata. And that's a wonderful thing as well, uh, because, of course, uh, and also said in this very direct way, yeah, because philosophers, they were only talking, yeah, so you can hear people talking, the, the choir, yeah, they're, they're talking between themselves, um, chattering, yeah, and then uh, the idea is to change it. You have this beautiful, again, beautiful C major theme that, that Prokofiev is so good at writing.
wanted to show you another example. Uh, this is the part which is called Revolution. Um, and here he clearly knew some agitprot music from the 20s. Yeah, he's inspired maybe by something like um, uh, there was a cantata, the Path to October collective work that in, involved this kind of choral declamations and uh, insertions of various sort of unusual instrument. Uh, or maybe even he knew pieces like pieces by Masalov, like something that we heard in, in our first lecture, uh, which also have these quotations or t themes that sound like folk songs. And all of that is thrown together. Yeah, it's a montage. You even have Lenin speaking there. Yeah, think about it. He wanted in, in 1937 Lenin to be shouting on stage, which is always a very funny moment. Anyway, uh, let's hear it. Accordions. Siren, also a very typical addition yeah, to the symphony orchestra in these agitprop pieces. So, what was wrong with that? Uh, well, that didn't get performed either and was kind of cancelled altogether uh, a few months before the, um, the, the date. And uh, the, the trouble was, first of all, that the words were authentic words by Marx and Engels and, and Lenin and Stalin. And by that stage, this was already inappropriate, yeah, because these were sacred words. You would not just speak them in vain. Uh, even uh, you would not necessarily read them, because at that point in 1938, slightly later, a book comes out which is called The Short Course of the History of the CPSU, of the Communist Party. And that's the book, the only book you were supposed to read. <laughs> you weren't supposed to read Lenin. And if you read Lenin's articles, you would not get that points that they wanted out of them, that you want, uh, they wanted to get you out of them. Yeah, so it's an interesting switch away from the, these uh, authentic words. Uh, so that was one one problem. Yeah, another problem, I guess, was with the setting. Like when, when Stalin's speech comes up, it's sung by a female choir. Yeah, so why? <laughs> why is that? Um, it's actually a beautiful theme again. It's about the constitution. So you can see he wanted to make it heavenly. Now, but it's it's a very slippery slope. So basically, it's a huge work in in, in ten sections. Yeah, ten big big movements. Um, and it was completely cancelled. He could not uh, present it at the anniversary. So then you get the opposite. Yeah? So he goes from this very ambitious and serious work, and very, very inventive, to something very simple, and something that I decided to illustrate with this fantastic painting, although it's from, from an earlier period, but from 1925, which is kind of primitivist. Yeah, so... Um, this is, this is what he starts doing. He start, starts writing very simple songs. So his next cantata is called Songs of Our Times, and it consists of nine quite short songs. Uh, I will give you one example. Um, maybe slightly difficult to explain to somebody who does not hail from Soviet Union like myself why this is so wrong, why his setting is so wrong, but I will do my best. 
Yes, uh, from border to border, over the summers where a free-willing eagle performs its flight, the people construct a beautiful song about Stalin the wise, our dearly beloved. Yes, you can feel the register of this song. Yeah, it's very grand. So let's hear first, not Prokofiev's setting, but Proko a setting by Isaac Donayevsky, yes, so the, the writer of mass songs. So uh, this is going to be quite loud, yes, so we're going to bring it down. So. themes here. Yeah, one is very kind of epic and uh, very magnificent at the very beginning. And then you have this very active march. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, two things. Now, what does Prokofiev do? Um, so, same text. <laughs> The words there are very grand, you know, saying, for example, the world of oppressors trembles with rage. Yeah, that's a complete tone deafness, yeah, as we would describe now. And so, suddenly, sometimes uh, you wouldn't think, you know, uh, it, it's comedy. Yeah, today it sounds like comedy. I don't really think it was intended as comedy, otherwise it would have been suicidal, right? So let's get to the uh, middle section, to the, um, the next section. <laughs> You see, see, see the words, yeah, fearful flame now burns even brighter. We rise up for the last battle. Yeah? <laughs> so the words completely don't have anything to do with this very lyrical music. So it came to my mind that I know where the prototype for this music is. Uh, and it's in Glinka, the famous traveling song by Glinka, so yeah, 100 years before Prokofiev. And maybe if this arrangement already existed, maybe he heard it performed by the Red Army Choir and thought that that was acceptable. This is actually a marvelous arrangement of the uh, traveling song, but it also has these two themes. Yeah, one is about the movement of a train, and another one is about getting excited about seeing your beloved. Yeah, so here we go. Uh, this is the whole... Linka, I want you to kind of feel the scene. of the middle section. Let's just compare it again. Yeah. 
similar, yes, with a little umpa 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 going in the background and this beautiful song flying over. Yes, so a good idea. Glinka is a good model at the time, very good model. Yeah, uh, and he is trying to do, maybe if, if this arrangement already existed, I haven't checked, um, something that the, the Red Army would perform, choir would perform. Yeah, so something completely, obviously a good thing, just not with that text. Yeah, so, so this is you know, me trying to explain to you why what he's doing is so wrong, and so badly wrong. Now, let's talk about uh, another piece, which was actually, um, uh, I guess, a qualified success. Um, but before that, we need to put uh, his next cantata, which is called Zdravica, or Hail to Stalin, um, or a toast to Stalin, sometimes uh, translated. In, in context, in the context of the cult of Stalin. The cult of Stalin was very gradually uh, increasing during the 30s. In 1933, people were still commenting with amazement that suddenly you get all these portraits of leaders yeah, on, on, the, on the day of the festival. So they didn't have them before. Yeah, suddenly everyone started carrying the same portrait. So that was kind of strange. Uh, musically, uh, one of the first... Uh, Things. The first things started coming from the republics rather than from the center. So this is one of the first uh, thing uh, which came for the Ukrainian festival um, of music. Yeah, so it, the idea was that uh, the best representatives of Ukrainian arts come to Moscow to report on the achievements yeah, and also express gratitude to the leader. So uh, this is the song by Lev Rivutsky, yeah, song about Stalin. You can see, by the way, how it was scratched out. Yeah, so that's during de-Stalinization. I just thought it would be nice to have that. Simple, yeah, but it's in a, in a folk style, yeah, in the style of a folk song. So that's totally acceptable. Um, they really were into uh, creating these folk verses, which we today call fake lore. Yeah, <laughs> they were, we would find somebody like like this person, Jambul Jambayev, who was a, a, an akin, yeah, so he was an epic singer in Kazakhstan. Um, the problem was he, he didn't. Um, speak Russian. So um, they would get him to sing something, and then a, a team of translators would turn it into this glory for Stalin. And things like that were collected from all, or collected or written, yeah, from all uh, the republics, and into this book. And I'm very proud to own it. Yeah, so this is a kind of huge collection of these verses. They are extremely funny if you start to read them. They're sort of unbelievable, but they have these, these lavish yeah, portraits of Stalin and Lenin and so on. So, uh, so this was the new fashion, yeah, to uh, dress up this glory for Stalin in national garb. And somehow I think it makes sense because it, it makes it not quite so embarrassing, yeah, because the words are very naive, it's so, so excessive. But it's not us, the composers, who are doing it. It's the people, yeah, and the people, of course, expressing their, uh, their feelings in this very naive way, and we can just sort of benignly smile at this. Um, another uh, example of that is Kachetrian's poem about Stalin, which is also written in this national style, and it's not even in a major key. This is what, what's so interesting about it. <laughs> Yeah, this, this kind of oriental style that he uses there. So uh, Prokofiev did exactly the same, and that was, this is a much later poster, but this is the idea, yeah, that people from different republics come to glorify Stalin, uh, and he uses a compilation and montage of these different verses from different uh, parts of the Soviet Union. 
but what he does at the start, he, he writes again a beautiful th theme in C major, which uh, kind of unifies all, all of these little um, ditties that, that are in the middle. Mm. And this is really, I think, a, sta a step towards uh, establishing something new in the Stalin cult. I think even Shostakovich was impressed by that theme and then many years later tried to do something similar in his Song of the Forest. <laughs> Like this is Gennady Rajeski conducting it in the rehearsal with a sarcastic smile. <laughs> I really wanted you to see that. So, uh, what happens with, with these verses? Again, you know, the verses are very naive. Yeah, the sign is shining differently on our us. It must have visited Stalin and the Kremlin. Uh, and the, the, the setting is, is quite, quite peculiar, so that um, in recent times, people have trying to read it as a kind of ironic statement. And they notice that the first time Stalin is mentioned, yeah, it's the interval of a triton, yeah, the devil's interval. <laughs> so they were trying to sort of show that, that actually, you know, Prokofiev was, was, was trying to put some secret message into this. Uh, and I don't know, it's a fact that there is a triton, yeah, but uh, knowing everything that we know about Prokofiev, knowing everything uh, that he, how he wanted to, um, you know, be the leader of Soviet music at this time, would, would really keep, was trying to write as many of these official pieces in various styles as possible. He was trying to win this game, you know, why, why would he in, intentionally sabotage himself? You know, uh, so it, it doesn't make make sense. It maybe is just part of of Prokofiev's grotesque style, yeah, so-called grotesque style, um, which he got so used to that he that didn't notice it. And actually, actually, that was the feature of his style that always brought him trouble in the Soviet Union. But not this time. Yeah, somehow they swallowed it. <laughs> There, the problematic moment. Yeah, too much text was fitted in into the preparation for the big climax. Yeah, so and, uh, the text again was was about Stalin suffering in in Tsarist prisons and things like that. Yeah, so again, not a good thing to uh, set it as this kind of buffer recitative. Yeah, so that was pointed out in one of the reviews. But nevertheless, yeah, this piece kind of passed amazingly, passed master and was recorded at the time. And of course, then it wasn't performed after the uh, death of Stalin for many years. And then when it was performed, it was de-Stalinized. I mean, you might be surprised that a work about Stalin could be de-Stalinized. Yeah, but you can do everything because the music was so wonderful and people wanted to hear it, wanted to save it. So they rewrote the lyrics. Uh, same thing as happens in the visual art, as you can see. Uh, one little example that I wanted to give from uh, 1939 song, where he again gets gets it wrong. So it's not; it's just like as if he's getting it right only by luck. Yeah, he doesn't quite understand what to do. So this is a song about a Stahanovite woman. Yeah, if you know who that was, yeah, that was all about raising productivity. So then s suddenly someone. 
uh, was producing 100 times more than the normal worker, yeah, and they became a hero, and they were, you know, given uh, valuable gifts and um, meet, visits to the Kremlin, maybe got to see Stalin and so on. So that was a very interesting moment in, in Soviet history when suddenly all talk of equality went out of the window because you started creating heroes out of ordinary people. Yeah, so these people now could have an American dream. Yeah, so a very interesting moment. Anyway, so Stahanovka might be somebody like that. She works in a textile, a textile factory. Or she might be someone like that, already reporting yeah, very, very powerfully about her achievements. Mm, and the music that Prokofiev wrote uh, is this. guessing yeah, that that is not right either. In fact, I thought it might have inspired Shostakovich in one of his satires, which he wrote much, much later. Um, it's the same kind of obsessive uh, focus on the third. Yeah, so in Prokofiev, you heard... Da, 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 da. Yeah, all, it's co constantly only kind, almost kind of idiotically repeating this interval. This is the primitivism thing. Um, and Shostakovich does this on purpose, of course. <clears throat> So it's a kind of, he probably saw this Prokofiev song once and thought, you know, this is really so bad. Uh, so very briefly about Prokofiev's very different trajectory at that time. Yeah, do you remember that we were talking about Shostakovich suffering both his lowest point and then a very high point with his fifth symphony? And what was Prokofiev doing all that time? It seems like after he came back, uh, he was sort of forgotten in quarantine, really. They put him in some kind of, you know, decontamination chamber um, because he, he arrived from the West and forgotten about, forgot about him mainly. Uh, because so many pieces that he wrote, you know, so many projects were canceled for various reasons. Uh, there were uh, older works that were not produced that they expected to be produced. There were uh, older works that were performed but criticized. So always, you know, he, he suffered from that. Um, even Romeo and Juliet, yeah, famously was delayed. Uh, there was something that he wrote, yeah, with Eisenstein, film score music for Alexander Nevsky, which had to be withdrawn because um, the Russians, yeah, signed the pact, Molotov-Ribbentrop pact with Hitler. Yeah, so the, the anti-German film could not be, be shown anymore. So he's, he was remarkably unlucky in various ways. Uh, yeah, and then there were arrests right next to him. Natalia Satz, who commissioned Peter and the Wolf, was arrested very soon after, although that, that was a successful piece. Of course, the moment he wanted to actually have Meyerhold produce one of his operas, Meyerhold was arrested too, yeah, and so on. And when the Stalin Prizes come in 1941, uh, Prokofiev was the only person who was actually... Mm, uh, voted for, yes, yeah, so it was already in the list that went up to the government, but then when he opened the newspaper on the day, his name wasn't there. So you can imagine how that felt. Yes, yeah, so he was singled out, his Alexander Nevsky cantata was not awarded. Uh, and uh, even though Romeo and Juliet, Lanova, who danced Ju uh, Juliet, uh, was, was given a Stalin Prize, yeah, this is a picture from the premiere, he was completely passed over, and nobody even suggested the Romeo and Juliet for the prize. So a very strange situation, yeah, a situation uh, where, where he is really struggling. Uh, very briefly uh, about the work that we're going to perform for you today, um, and this, I suppose, again, is a qualified success. 
Uh, this is a work already from the wartime when he was evacuated to Nalchik, which was in the kabardino balkarian Republic in the mountains. And uh, it was a commission from Hatu Timirkanov, uh, actually the father of the conductor Timirkanov that you might have heard of, uh, who was the cultural official. Uh, he didn't survive the war. He perished in the war during the occupation. But he uh, suggested to Prokofiev that Prokofiev write something on national themes. And Prokofiev almost never writes on national themes, yeah, because themes, melodies for him, is something that he's really proud of. So why would he take somebody else's material? He only did it once before in the Jewish overture, yeah, overture on Hebrew themes, and that was also a very successful thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, um, so he writes this piece, and apparently, yeah, he asked uh, Timur Kanov, you know, is it okay if I write a complex piece? You know, maybe your people will not be able to understand it straight away. And he says, well, don't worry, they will grow up, you know, and to your music, and they will enjoy it later. So this is what happened. Prokofiev, again, managed to do this very socialist, realist thing, yeah, writing of folk tunes on, the, on his own terms. You will hear that this music is, has a lot of very, very juicy, very fruity harmonies, starting from the word go, uh, that it has lots of interesting ways of playing the string instruments, uh, all the different types of pizzicato, you know, or sul ponticello, whatever, colonia, all these different things. Uh, and the, it reminds me not even so much of Bartok or Szymanowski, as people have suggested, but of, of De Faya, yeah, which is kind of had this Spanish style, which was also quite modernist, just for a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of um, uh, the harmonic uh, aura of Faya, De Faya's concerto. <laughs> this stacked up chords. You, you, will, you will hear some of that uh, kind of music in Prokofiev's quartet as well. So uh, in joy, we're going to perform the whole piece. It's going to be the Bodmin String Quartet. Uh, they're all postgraduate students uh, from the Guildhall and also from the Royal College of Music. Uh, they've learned this piece especially for this occasion. It's their project. Uh, so please give them a very, very warm welcome.
isn't this beautiful music? Yeah, and uh, rarely performed. Yeah, much rarer than the Shostakovich quartets, which are played all the time. Yeah, so um, be aware of this. Um, I just wanted to mention that obviously we're not leaving Prokofiev uh, yet, yeah, because he still has a few years to live. So we'll come back to him in the next two lectures. And please also look out for another, there are another three Gresham lectures that I've already done on this composer. The one on the War and, on War and Peace or, or opera, on the Prodigal Son, the ballet, and on piano music with Peter Donahue last year. So please uh, look out for them. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>